Today, I discussed the tide of good news flowing out of the Middle East, peace agreements between Israel and the UAE and Israel and Bahrain will be documented at the White House later today. Even more Arab countries are reportedly considering following suit. The winds of change are blowing across the Middle East. Thanks in large part to the hard work of the Trump administration, they are blowing toward peace. But I also mentioned yesterday that not everyone is happy. Not everyone in the Middle East is living in the 21st century. Some are too vested in the old fights and enmities and are afraid to let them go. President Abbas, who is now in the 16th year of a four-year term at the head of the Palestinian Authority, predictably tried to dismiss the compromise as nonsense. But as the Obama administration's Middle East expert, Dennis, wrote, Dennis Ross, <clears throat> wrote a few days ago, continuing this failed approach would just guarantee Palestinians would be left behind while the rest of the Arab world builds a better future. And then there's the theocratic basket case that is Iran. Last weekend, as if perfectly scripted, to contrast with the hopeful news of optimism and peace coming from the Arab world, the mullahs reminded the whole world of their flagrant disdain for human dignity and basic human rights. They carried out a hurried execution in the face of international condemnation. David Afkari, a 27-year-old Iranian wrestler, arrested during anti-government protest in 2018, was tortured into confessing to a murder of a security guard. He was hanged on Saturday. According to his mother, who was barred from visiting her son before his execution, David and two brothers arrested alongside him were forced to testify against one another. As they mourn their brother, these two young men themselves face decades in prison for standing up to the brutal injustices of the Iranian regime. Stories like this are tragic, but they aren't shocking. Not in a country where dissent and free expression are denied. Not from rulers who regularly use both domestic and international terrorism. This regime has its fingerprints on destabilizing campaigns, assassinations, and violence against civilians in every single corner of the Middle East, from the shores of the Mediterranean to the Gulf of Aden. The Obama-Biden administration's Iran deal, the JCPOA, did not improve any of this bad behavior. It ignored Iran's non-nuclear aggression. It let Tehran continue R&D on enriched uranium. If anything, Iran's behavior has only gotten worse. And that bad deal is still doing damage. This year, it will sunset a prudent UN Security Council resolution that had kept Iran from buying conventional weapons. And this summer, the UN Security Council, with the votes of Russia and China, refused to extend this 13-year-old embargo. Returning to the JCPOA has become a sort of mantra for our political left here in the United States. But really? The reflex to oppose everything President Trump does can be a gift to our adversaries. Former Vice President Biden promises to rush back into a bad deal without securing any improvements. He proposes we'd be able to renegotiate the bad deal from the inside of it after tossing away any leverage in advance. There's one right way to deal with regimes like Iran, toughness and resolve. That's why President Trump successfully restored an important measure of deterrence when he removed Iran's top terrorist, Soleimani, from the battlefield forever. Even though Tehran is weakened by sanctions, political unrest, and economic unease, they are also emboldened by our inter internal divisions and eager to exploit rifts among our allies. We know from publicly released intelligence that Iran seeks to interfere in our own politics. We know that Iranian-backed groups continue to threaten our forces in Iraq and Syria. 
We know that Iranian proxies like Hezbollah pose a growing threat to our ally Israel. Unity, strength, and resolve are the way to defend our security and our interests, not capitulation. Now, one final matter. For months now, it's been clear to basically every reasonable American that our country can and must hold two sets of true statements in our minds at the same time. Number one, our country has unfinished work to ensure that policing is fair to everyone and that black Americans do not feel unfairly treated or targeted by law enforcement. And number two, the vast majority of law enforcement officers are heroes, and the toxicity, anger, and actual violence that far-left mobs have inflicted on policemen and women across our country is simply beyond the pale. The American people want racial justice, and we want good, strong policing to ensure equal protection of the laws. We understand there is no contradiction here, none whatsoever. Most people are outraged by the killings of black Americans that have shocked our country. Sunday marks six months since the death of Breonna Taylor in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. Our people want answers. Our nation wants answers. But most Americans also feel sick when they hear about events like what happened last weekend in Los Angeles. Two sheriff's deputies were ambushed and shot while they sat in their patrol car in Compton. And then far-left protesters tried to literally block block an entrance to the hospital, chanting things like, kill the police, and I hope they die. Fortunately, both deputies are out of surgery, but the hateful climate that creates these acts is still with us. And one of our two political parties should do more to repudiate the underlying climate on their side. To be clear, Democratic leaders, including Vice President Biden and our colleague like the junior senator from California, spoke up quickly to condemn the actual shootings of these officers themselves. That was absolutely the right thing to do, no question. But what about the underlying climate? For months, the political left in this country has put all its might behind a false narrative that says disorder is acceptable. Riots or free speech, and law enforcement is the real enemy of certain communities. One prominent national newspaper, which found a straightforward op-ed from our colleague, Senator Cotton, to be more than they could bear, had no problem publishing a submission entitled, Yes, We Mean Literally Abolish the Police. No problem publishing that. Yes, we mean literally abolish the police. When the Speaker of the House was asked to respond to rioters illegally toppling statues across the country, she blithely responded, people will do what they will do. That was about toppling statues. And from one liberal big city to another, we have seen mayors and local leaders who apparently find it easier to propose cutting police funding and criticize their men and women in uniform than to denounce out-of-control riots in their very own cities. Just yesterday, with this Los Angeles story making headlines nationwide, the junior senator from Massachusetts decided to criticize police officers on his Twitter feed and proposed a nationwide ban on non-lethal measures like tear gas and rubber bullets a nationwide ban on non-lethal measures like tear gas and rubber bullets. We're now at a point where some of our Democrat colleagues survey the nation, survey the way law enforcement officers are being treated, and decide the answer is to keep rhetorically throwing cops under the bus, throwing them under the bus, and try to ban their non-lethal means of self-defense while they're at it. The American people don't have any trouble rejecting terrible racism and discrimination and rejecting lawlessness, violence, and anti-police prejudice with equal clarity and equal force. They deserve leaders who can do likewise.